Although the universe of Warhammer 40k is primarily known for its bombastic over-the-top battles and heroes of legend that stand defiant in the face of mankind's many enemies, the Milky Way galaxy of the 41st millennium is one that is absolutely saturated in cosmic horrors and is the absolute perfect setting for some good old-fashioned scary stories. In the short story The Last Ascension of Dominic Seraph, written by David Annandale and included in the Warhammer horror anthology Maledictions, we are introduced to two individuals who, at the height of their career, had experienced power and authority like few others in history. But now, after a series of grievous mistakes and unforgivable sins, have been cast out, condemned to Aramis, where they will spend their nights drinking away the pain of their past and cursing the names of all those that wronged them. Little do they know that their lives are about to change forever. An unknown horror from beyond the stars has come to their planet, thrusting our fallen heroes into a desperate race for survival, every step pushing them further and further down a path of madness and insanity, wherein the only salvation will be to confront both the unrestrained terror of the present and the bitter sins of their past. Come with me, my friends, as we dive into another macabre entry in the grimdark story hour. Gather round and listen well to the last ascension of Dominic Seraph. But before we dive headfirst into the grimdark, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. In 2023, most of us are well aware that taking care of our mental health is incredibly important. But even still, sometimes there's just a lot of things that can get in the way of getting signed up with a therapist. Maybe we're just too busy and can't find the time. Or maybe there's no one in our area that specializes in our particular needs. Or maybe it's something as simple as therapy being too expensive and not being able to find a way to fit it in the budget. Well, thankfully there's today's sponsor, BetterHelp, who makes something as serious as taking care of our mental health more accessible, convenient, and affordable. They have a huge network of over 30,000 licensed therapists who are trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. And due to their massive network, they have a much wider range of specialists than may be available in your specific area. And it's no problem if you work late or have crazy hours. With BetterHelp, you can schedule therapy sessions at a time that's most convenient for you. And if after a couple of meetings you feel the therapist just isn't the right fit, you can easily switch to a new one at no additional cost without stressing about insurance or who's in your network or anything like that. Getting started is super easy. All you have to do is click on the link in the description of this video and fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs. And in most cases, within 48 hours, you'll be matched with your therapist. Now, over 4 million people have used BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life. And if you think you might benefit from some therapy, then click on the link in the description of this video or go to www.betterhelp.com slash Weshammer to get 10% off your first month. Big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Our story begins atop a jagged tower of rockcrete and blackened iron where we find Lord Commissar Dominic Seraph and Inquisitor Ingrid Schenk enjoying a bottle of Amasek together. They would often sit together like this and watch as various pieces of debris from the orbiting ship graveyard above would break free and streak across the night sky, both quietly ruminating on every wrong decision they had made throughout their careers that led them to Aramis, this rotten junkyard of a planet. The booze tasted awful, Aramis was incapable of producing anything that even remotely resembled quality these days, and its Amasek was no different. But Dominic thought that, to its credit, it was strong, and it warmed the chest with every sip. Dominic figured that the planet wouldn't truly die within his lifetime, and that it would continue to stubbornly cling to existence for a few centuries more, long after he was no longer here to watch over it. But he didn't really care. Ever since Armageddon, he found it difficult to care about anything at all. To your health, Inquisitor, he said, raising his glass. And to yours, Lord Commissar. Do you know, I can no longer remember if we use each other's titles out of respect or as an insult. I think it was about ten years ago that I asked myself that same question. I couldn't remember then, either. Dominic shrugged. It doesn't really matter, does it? Does anything? Sometimes, larger pieces would break free from the procession of dead vessels and would make it to the surface charred but intact, much like how the carcasses of the leviathan sea-dwelling creatures of old Earth would descend into the inky depths upon their death, their bodies going to support a vast menagerie of smaller carrion feeders 
so too would the population of Aramis descend upon the wreckage of the fallen ships, breaking them down into scrap to support their struggling existence. Dominic wondered just how many ships were up there. It seemed unlikely that they had all been born of Aramis. It perhaps the suffocating gravity of this dying planet was strong enough to call all of the dead ships from across the stars to join in its funeral attendance and bear witness to its final moments as it rotted away to nothingness. It was in that moment that a massive chunk broke free and streaked across the skyline, coming down like a fiery comet. It landed with a thunderous explosion in one of the major population centers, the corresponding fireball lighting the night sky. From their position in the tower, they could just barely make out the distant sound of screaming. If this had been any other planet, this certainly would have been cause for alarm, but not on Aramis. To live here was to accept that death was around every corner. Life was short, sad, and much like the planet itself, ultimately worthless. Dominic took another swig of his Amasek and pointed out at the fire. What about that one? Shall we say he was on that one? Yes, that would be a true fiery end. They raised their goblets. Sebastian Yarrick. The Emperor Grant you are on that. This is what they would do every night. They would drink and watch the skyline, imagining that the man they both blamed for their fates was dying in a fiery explosion. In his youth, Dominic had come up in the Skola Progenium alongside Sebastian Yarrick. The two started off as friends, but eventually developed something of a rivalry. They would both end up becoming commissars together and eventually served under Commissar Rasp. However, when their mentor suffered a moment of weakness, Yarrick proved to Dominic just how little loyalty meant to him, putting a bolt round through their master's skull. Dominic would never forgive him, and perhaps due to the bitterness that he held for his former peer, when they both found themselves on opposite political sides on Armageddon, Dominic would end up staying loyal to the infamous Hermann von Straub for far longer than he reasonably should have. Mercifully, in a moment of clarity, he managed to cut ties before the Second War of Armageddon had truly begun, and thus avoided the sentence of treason. Instead, as punishment, he had been assigned to Aramis, exiled to spend the rest of his days watching over the miserable wretches that would be conscripted into the Astra Militarum as cannon fodder, for the men and women of this world were truly good for little else. For the Lady Inquisitor's part, she had just as much reason to hate Sebastian Yarrick. She was no normal Inquisitor, but belonged to a little-known order known as the Revivicators, a group that had dedicated their lives to learning all there was to know about the soul's transition into the Immaterium at the moment of their death, their ultimate goal to find a way to bring a soul back into the body of the dead, to hopefully one day be able to revive the Emperor of Mankind. It was the Ordo's perspective that such a noble goal was one that justified any cost, no matter how extreme or inhumane. Shank had been stationed on the planet of Molus and had been experimenting with a viral strain of plague known as the Curse of Unbelief, a terrifying disease that had been responsible for the death of untold millions across the galaxy. Named for the fact that the plague seemed to only be capable of infecting those who lacked faith in the Emperor, its effects were beyond horrifying. Not only did it kill the infected, but shortly after their death, the body would be reanimated into a plague zombie, whose only remaining ambition was to further the spread of the plague. That teeny tiny spark of life that managed to return to these creatures was of great interest to the Ordo. It was their belief that if they could somehow harness the plague and purge it of its chaos corruption, then they could create a viral compound, a faith virus that could return the soul to the body of the deceased. Now, such a virus would gain the order a considerable amount of insight into the nature of life and death and would prove invaluable in their ultimate goal of reviving the emperor. However, none of their experiments had ever proven successful. It was Shank's ambition to succeed where the revivicators that had come before had failed. But in order to do this, she needed to thoroughly understand the curse and in order to understand it, she needed to see it in action. So, one fateful night long ago, her and her followers had unleashed it upon an unsuspecting underhive. It had been Sebastian Yarrick himself that led the charge that brought ruin to her experiments, to her plans, and to her career as an Inquisitor. Like Dominic, she had been exiled to Aramis, but continued to pursue the goals of her Ordo, 
performing tests on the local population. Although on numerous occasions she had gone into thorough detail on the importance of her work, Dominic believed that the only thing she had actually accomplished was to teach a handful of unlucky civilians new ways to suffer. He assumed that like him, she was just going through the motions and didn't think her experiments would lead to any actual breakthrough. They were honestly quite the pair, a Lord Commissar and an Inquisitor, two individuals that had soared to heights inconceivable for most of mankind, but had flown too close to the proverbial sun and plummeted into a profound abyss of resentment and indignation. In their exile, they no longer had access to the expensive rejuvenant treatments that preserved the youth of the Imperium's most prized servants. They had grown old, and day by day, they felt their bodies mimicking the slow decay of the planet that would one day become their tomb. At this point, the only thing they really had to give their life any sense of purpose or meaning was their duty. And despite the pointless meagerness of their station, they clung to that duty in much the same way that a drowning man lost at sea will cling to anything that floats. Although neither of them would ever admit it out loud, in their shared bitterness, they had found in each other something of a kindred spirit. And unlike the dregs of Aramis, someone who at the bare minimum was capable of intelligent conversation. It was at that moment that over the horizon, another piece of wreckage could be seen plummeting from orbit, one whose fiery trail was considerably smaller than the previous one and whose impact created a tremor that was barely noticeable. But something was off about it. It radiated a deep sensation of wrongness. Now, over the years, Dominic had witnessed thousands of such artificial comets, and despite their variance in size and impact, there was a certain pattern to their cascade. Whereas most would streak randomly across the sky, this one plummeted straight down with malicious purpose and had hit with almost pinpoint accuracy one of the most densely populated areas within the region. That looked different, said Shank. Dominic stood up and moved to the pitted Rock Creek parapet. Yes, that hit like a torpedo. Are there any ships in the area? I've not been told of any. Shank got up from her chair and joined him on the parapet. They watched the glow from the initial blast begin to fade away before multiplying into hundreds of smaller fires that shimmered like angry candlelights against the darkness of night, a faint nimbus of green hovering just over the city. Do you see a glow over that sector? I can't decide. Perhaps. The area seems brighter than it should be. Dominic put down his goblet. Then we will have to have a closer look at this. I don't know whether to feel interested or inconvenienced. I think both, said Shank. There were no streets left on Aramis. It was a wasteland of jagged iron, indistinguishable refuse, and the tattered shells of buildings. In order to make it to the impact site, our pair needed to make their way on foot. However, whereas a newcomer to this planet would certainly get lost in only a couple of minutes, with no distinguishable landmarks to mark their way, our pair had made this journey multiple times in the past, they made a brief stop at the barracks to recruit an escort of 20 soldiers before heading the rest of the way to the impact site. They were both cloaked in their attire of office, he wearing his commissar's coat and her wearing a dark shawl pinned in place with her inquisitorial rosette. At this point, their outfits were a shell of their former selves. They were shabby and unkept and covered in soot and ash. They looked like caricatures of their former selves, but although they may have been mocked if seen in this state by their former colleagues, here on Aramis, they still had godlike authority. As they approached the impact site, they could hear the telltale signs of unrest and violence, screams echoing across the refuse gorges. Dominic could also hear other sounds that he couldn't quite place, but reminded him of logs crackling in a fire. The only difference was that these sounds were wet. At one point, they had to squeeze through a narrow pass of two mounds of iron, and even though they were still half a mile from the impact site, on the other side of the pass, they found utter chaos. The fires here were raging out of control, and in the time it had taken them to walk from the tower, the flames had spread out over the entire sector. They stood before a massive roiling wall of fire that barred them from going any further. This is not the result of a simple debris strike. These are deliberate fires. Dominic could smell the telltale chemical tang of Prometheum, Whatever that thing had been, whoever had fired it had targeted this area in particular, due to its cache of flammable effluent. Although it was difficult to make out anything through the inferno, 
Dominic swore that he could see the hazy silhouette of men and women pushing others into the flames. There is madness here. I will need to interrogate one of the affected. It was in that moment that through a gap in the fire, a man could be seen bolting out of a nearby doorway, his clothing and hair smoldering, his eyes wide with panic. And when he turned and lay eyes on the uniforms of those that stood before him, he froze like a deer in the headlights. Before he could run away, Dominic shouted to his men to restrain him, and the two largest of the group stepped forward. For the briefest of moments, this individual seemed like he was contemplating the alternative, to throw himself into the inferno. But in a moment of clarity, he allowed himself to be captured. Our story jumps forward a short while later, and we find ourselves in a squat bunker, a building that was less than a mile east of Dominic's tower. This was the Inquisitor's domain, her makeshift laboratory. Now the room stank of old blood and stale fear, and Dominic assumed that the dark stains that adorned the floor and walls were the remnants of her prior experiments. The troopers tossed the man into one of the cells, and he quickly scrambled into the corner, curling up and trembling like a leaf in the wind. His arms were covered in burns and weeping blisters, yet his teeth chattered as if he was caught in a winter's gale. All the while, his panic-stricken eyes stared unblinking at something outside of the cell, barely aware of his captors. Shank ordered the guardsmen to leave and secured the heavy iron door shut behind them before turning and walking back to the prisoner. She crouched down next to him to get a better look. Well, what is your name? The man's lips moved silently. He was shaking his head in short, rapid jerks, his eyes fixed on a greater terror than the Inquisitor. She snapped her fingers in front of his face before reaching out to grab and twist his burned arm. He screeched in alarm and pain, and his attention snapped back to her. What is your name? Remus. Arvin Remus, he rasped. Good, Citizen Remus, why is your district on fire? She kept his left arm in her grip and squeezed once more to keep his fear focused on her. His head shook more violently, the words coming out in a rushing, desperate mutter. Burn the dream. We have to burn the dream. His eyes were locked onto the Inquisitor, and he grabbed her arm with his right hand. <laughs> promise me I won't dream. You won't let me dream. Promise me, promise me. He sobbed. They were all dreaming. Oh, my children. Such dreams. I, I can't dream. Will you promise? Will you promise me? Will you promise me? She shook his arm free, stood up, and took a step back the prisoner once again retreating into his corner where he rocked back and forth, muttering about dreams and fire. This is getting us nowhere. Maybe not, but it does confirm that there was something in that object. She turned back to the prisoner. What landed was something set loose. <laughs> dreams, Remus whispered. No, no, not dreams. Dreams of the end of dreams. Dreams of decay. Catching, catching. They both exchanged a worried look. A plague. This is more your territory than mine. I will need to see. When the fires die down, I will go back in. She grimaced. He keeps talking about dreams. This does not sound like a plague. No, no! Remus shouted. He looked back and forth between them, his eyes staring wide, looking as though they might jump right out of his skull. Don't let me. You mustn't let me dream. Why won't you stop the dream? You mustn't let me dream! He scrambled forward, reaching for the hem of Dominic's coat. A second later, he shrank back, eyes closed. He clawed at the walls, breaking his fingernails. Stop the dream! With a terrified screech, Remus began frantically clawing at his eyes, his jagged, broken fingernails hooking into the soft meat. His cries turned into a single reverberating scream. As he began to dig forward, his eyelids liquefied and ran down his cheeks like melting candle wax. His eyeballs began to suck his fingers in deeper and deeper like a hungry predator gorging on prey. His eyelashes twisted and elongated, becoming whip-like razors that thrashed about, ripping through skin, muscle, and bone. With a splintering sucking sound, his fingers finally broke free of his hand and disappeared into the hungry, predatory substance of his eyes. His arms fell back, and his body began to convulse, the flesh around the stumps of his fingers rapidly deteriorating and flaking away in black strips. Rot hungrily snaked its way up his arms and across his body. 
The frenzied, wet crunching of bone could be heard from his eye sockets as his eyes ground his severed fingers to pulp before blossoming into a flurry of black petals, their edges each glistening with lethal sharpness. A pungent aroma filled the cell, smelling of the sweetest off-world perfumes mixed with rotting meat. Despite the absolute horror of the grotesque metamorphosis that was taking place before them, the Commissar and the Inquisitor saw no end in sight. More and more petals unfolded from Remus's eyes, with each new layer, the unholy flowers pushing themselves further and further out of his skull, to the point where they were over a yard long. Trembling and flailing against the ground, his blood-curdling screams finally mercifully stopped when his tongue swelled and coiled into a thick, maggoty rope of slime and mold. The pressure of the growth caused the bones in his skull to fracture and eventually burst apart, but the petals never stopped growing. Up, higher and higher they pressed until they were eventually against the ceiling, their stem now consisting of a trembling gray sludge. As quickly as it had started, the change suddenly ceased. The monstrous flower toppled forward with a wet slap against the cell floor before rapidly succumbing to decay. The moist gelatinous pile of sludge that had once been Remus gave way to black ash that caught and traveled on a non-existent wind throughout the room. Dominic had his back pressed against the wall, his breaths coming in short, shallow gasps. Shank had turned pale as a sheet and stood there stunned, unable to comprehend what she had just seen. Their terrified eyes locked onto each other, and in a moment of clarity, they turned and rushed out of the room, slamming the door shut behind them. You'll need to have this sealed. What kind of plague is this? I don't know. I've never encountered anything like that before. Due to the fact that she was an inquisitor, her response filled Dominic somehow with even more dread than the horror he had just bore witness to. Airborne, are we infected? No, not yet at any rate. The symptoms seemed to develop quickly, a few hours at most. They moved into another one of the cells and sealed themselves inside, waiting out the next several hours in dreadful anticipation for similar changes to begin to manifest in themselves. Every single second that passed, Dominic was convinced that he would soon feel a fluttering in his lungs or the swelling of his tongue. But by the end of the third hour, no symptoms had developed. They began to discuss the nature of the plague and how it could be spreading. It clearly wasn't airborne or they surely would have been infected by now. Shank theorizes that it might have something to do with the dust, that it could be airborne, just that it was larger particles. After the terror within the cell, it began to make sense to them why the residents of the district chose to light their town on fire. They discuss what to do next. And quarantining the zone makes sense, but due to the ragged terrain, lack of roads, and no excavator equipment to build a ditch with, it would take too much time. They would have to make do with his infantry creating a barricade. The conversation turns into the possibility of a vaccine, but Shank tells him that that wasn't going to happen. So the only option left was amputation to purge the entirety of the infected region. It was in that moment that a sudden thought occurred to Dominic. It is worth investigating further though, yes? I could just order an immediate bombardment. That step will be necessary, but you are correct. There will be something of value to learn first. Valuable in more than one way. Precisely. For the first time since Armageddon, Dominic felt the thrill of hope run through his old veins. A new plague cataloged, analyzed, and contained, he said. A threat to the galaxy halted, Shank added. With this newfound hope came Dominic's first real smile in living memory. Well, it may be that what has fallen from the skies will make us rise again. The Emperor protects, and he also avenges. The story jumps forward several hours. Dominic has established a perimeter of infantry around the quarantine zone and was planning on having it bombarded. The barrier was admittedly larger than it needed to be, but was a precaution that Shank appreciated. And what did it really matter anyways? From her perspective, a few extra thousand civilians lost to artillery shelling was barely even worth reporting. The only thing that mattered was that the threat was contained, identified, and eliminated. Although the symptoms they witnessed were indeed disturbing, she felt a great sense of relief that the foul contagion that was unleashed at the impact site had not been the curse of unbelief. That would have felt too much like her past reaching back out to haunt her. 
At this point in the story, our pair decides to split up. Dominic goes to secure the perimeter, while Shank decides to push further into the quarantine zone. Armed with her inquisitorial rebreather and a squad of 20 troopers using similar devices, she pushed further than they had before. However, she hadn't even made it in 100 yards before the screaming started. They sounded far too close to be coming from the burned area, but the heaps of metal wreckage scattered all around caused the sound to fracture. Screams and wails rose and fell from every direction, surrounding the group in a cacophony of human suffering. It was an orchestra of grief and agony, all woven together into a sound that she had only heard once before, long ago on the day her career died. It was the violent, tortured death scream of an entire city. She signaled to her men to be ready to fight. Letting anyone pass them at this point was completely out of the question. Now, under normal circumstances, she would certainly try to capture a few specimens, though after seeing what had happened to Remus and how he had died and rotted away in a handful of minutes, she doubted any of them would be much use to her. She would have to be content with simply observing the effects of the plague. She would come back for samples later, but right now, learning how to contain the plague was her top priority. The group moved in the direction of the closest screams and ducked into the gutted shell of a hab block. The shrieks were getting louder, more guttural, and to Shank's dismay, less human. Eventually, they rounded a corner and found the source of the screaming. It was a group of around 30 people, dragging themselves along the ground, gouging their flesh open on the sharp, rusted edges of the wreckage, desperately trying to scrape away the heavy masses of tumors that had sprouted all over their bodies. They were moving away from the center of the infection, and with every step they took, their bodies were beginning to change. One of the men had lost both of his legs and was now dragging himself across the rockcrete floor, leaving behind a green trail of boiling, bubbling slime. The body of the woman ahead of him was beginning to flatten out, her ribs bulging out and piercing the soft flesh of her torso, before elongating and twisting into thrashing, bloody tentacles. As the crowd continued, she watched as limbs rotted away and were left where they fell. Tentacles burst from necks, flesh sloughed from the bone, and even a few of the faces she saw had twisted in such a manner that they now resembled nothing more than gaping, snapping jaws. There was no pattern to the metamorphosis, no logic behind the twisted transformations she was witnessing. The only constant was rapid onset change, followed by immediate violent decay. Some of the civilians were still running, fleeing in primal horror in the direction of the troopers. Their movements were erratic and clumsy, and the ones that still had eyes didn't even seem to notice them. Their gaze fixated on some unseen horror, invisible to Shank and the rest of the group. The men opened fire before she could give the order, the volley of Laz fire ripping into the fleeing crowd. The moment their smoldering bodies hit the ground, they erupted in sudden explosive change, propelling the dust of their final disintegration up into the air, spreading in every direction. But there was no wind to carry it. It was as if the dust was being driven by unnatural, intelligent impulse. Wherever it landed, the plague spread. Her and Dominic had been incredibly lucky and had escaped unscathed. But now, she bore witness to the unmistakable evidence of the plague's power. An icy terror gripped around her heart, and she began to back away. Not because of the carnage of the infected, nor because of the dust arcing from their bodies and swirling plumes. It was the other way the plague was spreading. It was the other form of infection that she was now witnessing take hold. And despite her exile, she had never abandoned her faith as a revivicator. She continued her work, desperately seeking a way to bring life back to the dead. She still held on to her Ordo's ambition that one day, all of their efforts would be worth it, and the God Emperor of Mankind would rise again from his golden throne. She never stopped believing that such a miracle was possible, but had given up hope that she would be the one to find it. Instead, venting her anger and bitterness on the test subjects that found themselves strapped to her Medicaid tables. But now, here in front of her, she was witnessing what her Ordo had sought for so long, new life springing from dead matter. But this was no miracle. This was not revival. The horrors that were being birthed by the dust had never been alive at all. It was the very stone, rockcrete, iron, and glass itself that moaned and wailed, screaming their birth scream in defiance of reality. 
the flat surfaces of the buildings, the broken roads and sheets of debris wrinkled like flesh. Rigid material bent, tore, and parted, revealing row upon row of glistening teeth and a thousand staring eyes. What moments before had been inanimate, twisted into an ugly mockery of life, screaming and writhing in terror of its unnatural, diseased existence. Wherever the dust fell, the infection spread, the plumes rushing forward to blanket the industrial landscape of Aramis in an all-consuming tide. Shank broke her gaze from the wailing, gibbering abominations before her and looked back in the direction of the impact site. There, she saw even greater dust plumes, some stretching miles into the sky. And to her absolute horror, she witnessed entire hills moving, sliding down as they decayed, struggling to lurch forward as if they might somehow escape their inevitable doom. There was movement in every direction that she looked, the plague was spreading to everyone and everything, faster than anyone could react. Now, somehow, a critical mass had been reached, and the disease was reaching out to grasp all of Aramis at once. In that moment, the futility of her life's work and the delusional hope of an effective quarantine shattered. Her and her troopers were still backing away, managing to hold on to some semblance of order. Although they had managed to drop every mutating civilian that they had come into contact with, it was apparent now that they were not the threat. It was the dust. And although all of the bodies now lay still, no longer crawling or thrashing about, each and every one of them was rapidly withering away into more dust that was picked up by the invisible, formless wind to be spread across the world. Shank gave the order, telling her men to run, to get back to the perimeter. She had worried before that, due to her old age, if they encountered something they weren't capable of handling, she wouldn't be able to run like she used to. But she found that being confronted with a horror beyond comprehension provided her old bones just the encouragement they needed to flee from danger. Now, despite her order, she knew that the perimeter wouldn't offer any form of meaningful protection, but she couldn't think about that. They had to get away. She had to ignore the pain in her limbs and keep moving. But to where? Where could they possibly go to escape what was happening? The dust is contagious. Do not let it touch you. The order was received, and the group turned and ran. Now, up until this moment, the troopers had managed to keep it together, holding to whatever semblance of discipline Dominic had managed to instill in them. But the second they saw an inquisitor of the Holy Ordos, someone with godlike authority that surely could end any crisis that was set before them, running away, they broke. If the Inquisition was helpless, then there truly was no hope. They dropped their weapons and ran in fear from the eldritch horror unfolding behind them. More and more dust rose up as the larger buildings and mountains of refuse caught the infection, their decomposing forms hurling forth into the sky a torrent of dust like ash from a volcanic eruption. As unstoppable as the plague seemed, in this moment, the dust was only spreading a short distance outward as if the infection was advancing in incremental stages. It didn't make any sense. From where she was standing, she could see dust swirling above the wreckage multiple miles into the sky. There was enough that the entire inhabitable area could be infected in an instant. It was as if there was some form of terrifying intelligence behind the plague that was biding its time, gathering its strength for a final devastating blow. The idea chilled her to the very core. All at once, she was forced to face the unfathomable depths of her own ignorance. Before this plague, this rot, this malefic sentience, whatever it was, her entire existence was insignificant. After a lifetime of study, she now realized that she understood nothing. Before this foulness, she was weak and helpless, no better than the lowest and most ignorant of serfs. She was nothing more than another terrified tiny figure fleeing in panic. The much younger soldiers managed to pull ahead of her, and they were still in her sight when the plague finally caught them. One fell, then the other, then the rest in quick succession, the contagion jumping faster and faster as more of the group became infected. She came to a screeching halt, her heart thundering in her chest and the rasping of her lungs sounding like the scraping of rusting metal echoing inside of her rebreather. She stared at the twisted bodies of the soldiers in front of her, and with a look of pure bewilderment spread across her face, she realized that there was no dust on any of their bodies. 
As far as she could tell, no dust had fallen anywhere in the immediate area. If it had, then surely she would have been infected too. She could see no tangible evidence for why the soldiers were convulsing and metamorphosizing in front of her. Their bodies opening up, their organs snapping at each other with stingers and claws, their bones whiplashing in contortions of ecstasy and pain. There was something she was missing, some piece of the puzzle that she just wasn't seeing. At every turn, this plague had defied her expectations and proved that she didn't even grasp its most basic elements. But that didn't matter now. She had to keep moving, even if she had been wrong about the dust, even if she was wrong about how the plague spread in the first place. She had seen firsthand the dust infect stone and metal. If she was caught in the dust fall, she would die in a swirling whirlpool of thrashing rebar and rock creek jaws. She had to think the only path forward was through the dying troopers, as to backtrack and try to detour around the buildings would take at least a half an hour to route back to the perimeter. So with the desperate, unfounded hope that she was somehow immune, she made her move and ran through the liquefying bodies, her boots sloshing through viscera and gore, the hands of the dying feebly grasping out at her dress for salvation. But she made it through them and kept running. She moved through the stained leaning walls of the hab blocks onwards until she reached the passage between the buildings. Even though the terror was snapping at her heels and clutching at her heart, deep in her soul, she truly believed she was immune. Even if that notion was simply buried away in her subconscious and clouded by reason and terror, her soul was one of stone that had been shaped and polished year upon year by frustration and disappointment. Her subconscious mind refused to let her believe that this is where it would all end, that all her misery had been for nothing. Such an end was not permissible for an inquisitor. The emperor and fate would not allow it. And so she continued forward, clad in the armor of soured pride, as behind her, the clouds of monstrous transformation gathered their strength. What have you done, Inquisitor? Dominic muttered under his breath. From his position on the perimeter, he watched as one after another, plumes of dust erupted throughout the infected zone. His eyesight wasn't what it used to be in his youth, but he thought he could detect movement everywhere in the distance. Now, at one point, he thought he saw an entire hail of detritus drop out of view, a massive cloud of dust shooting up in response. This had all happened within minutes of Shank entering the contaminated sector. The trooper to his right pointed out in front of them, indicating to him that the Inquisitor had returned, though upon seeing her, he felt the term fleeing or retreating would have been more appropriate. As she approached, panting for breath, she reached up and tore off her rebreather. We have to go, now. This cannot be contained. Dominic hesitated. He knew he wasn't perfect, and he had made plenty of mistakes in the past, but he was a Lord Commissar, and he had never abandoned a post. It ran contrary to everything that defined him. Remaining is futile. There is no duty here. There is nothing that can be fought. There is only death. What happened? The plague is spreading everywhere. I cannot fathom how it functions, but I know we cannot stop it. He looked back out at the roiling clouds of dust and listened as second by second, the moaning of the quarantine zone began to sound more and more inhuman. He had never imagined for even a moment that he would ever bear witness to an inquisitor in such a state of terror. And he found that her fear was infectious. Duty fell away from him, ambition crumbled, and in that moment, he was no longer Lord Commissar Dominic Seraf. He was simply an old man that didn't want to die. He announced to his men that they were pulling back, that they were to regroup at the barracks and prepare for new orders. But those orders would never come. He simply wanted the troops to leave the way clear for his own retreat. He turned to leave, but the shame compelled him to give one final command. If I fall, then do as necessity requires. They were meaningless words but he used them as a shield against his guilt as him and the Lady Inquisitor began to run. With the quarantine line broken apart, the soldiers began to run from the moaning doom at their backs. They were young and fast, and in moments, Dominic and Shank were left behind. He was thankful that at the very least, he was spared the indignity of having his men see him fleeing for his own life. They switched directions and began to head north through the wreckage in the general direction of the spaceport. Now, Shank tells him that no place was safe on the planet and the only salvation would be to get off world. 
The only problem was the spaceport was more than 10 miles from their current position and they had no idea how they were going to reach it. But even still, it was their only hope, so they had to try. It was out of their hands now. The dust storm would either come for them or it wouldn't. There was nothing they could do to prevent it. How have we not been infected? Are we immune? I have wondered the same thing, that both of us should be so lucky and for no apparent reason. It seems unlikely. Uh, even so. Even so. And immunity does us no good when the city itself is infected. They eventually came upon a section of ground that sloped upwards into a rise, high enough that it gave them a good view of the next few miles. To the northwest, Dominic's tower was visible on the horizon, while the spaceport was still far out of sight. However, directly in front of their path, another plume of dust was rising into the clouds. The prison. We sealed the cell. That doesn't matter. The dust spreads the plague to inanimate matter. As if the dust or whatever will embodied it had been waiting for them to bear witness and to know their way was closed, the storm struck. The cloud over the prison fell upon the city with a dark embrace of change and death. The vista all around them erupted with panic screams. They turned and ran, heading in the direction of Dominic's tower. The decision was not made with logic or sound reasoning. The tower wasn't immune to change, and when the dust came, it too would twist and contort into a horror of flesh and steel. But there was nowhere else to run, and the familiarity of the tower created the illusion of refuge. They ran as fast as they could, slowed by obstacle and age, the cries of the transforming city drawing ever closer behind them. They were in a tightening noose of plague, despair and exhaustion dragging them down, urging them to accept the end. Fear was driving them, but so too was resentment and bitterness. If they had just managed to contain this new plague, if they had figured out what it was and how it functioned, they would have been given a second chance. They would have risen to greatness again, their slate wiped clean, and the sins of their past forgiven. Instead, an entire world would fall under their watch. What is this plague? How have we avoided contagion? He demanded. I don't know. I can't make sense of the infection's form. There is no clear pattern to what it does. It is irrational. The only constant is horror. As if that could be the contagion. The plague behaves more like the dream of a disease than the reality of one. The nightmare was closing in from every direction. The sky was thick with malignant clouds that brought with them a sweeping cascade of infected dust. As they ran for the tower, they witnessed an abandoned manufacturing complex give in to twisting metamorphosis, its chimneys screaming in terror as their stacks opened into gaping maws, each of them belching a torrent of sickly green flame upwards into the sky, blackening their virgin flesh. The first moments of their unnatural life being marked by terror and profound suffering. In midair, the flames changed into a torrent of green liquid, each and every droplet of molten slag briefly flaring into sickening unlife, only to bellow out in pain before rotting away to dust. With the dustfall closing in all around them, and a cacophony of a billion inhuman screams thundering in from every direction, they made it to the tower. Dominic slammed the iron door shut and latched it closed, for all the good that it would do. The power was out in the city, and the only illumination in the dark tower was from the thin beams cast by the windows up above. There was nowhere left to go, nowhere to run. All they could do was wait for the inevitable. Dominic turned and looked at the Inquisitor and saw the depths of his own terror reflected back at him in her face. His knees buckled and he could hardly breathe. He wanted to shout at her, to demand answers. It was her job to know these things. It was her duty. He desperately wanted her to give him an answer that was in any way different than the one he already knew. As if the tower itself could detect his thoughts, it gave him an answer. Its walls began to grow moist and slick before twisting and groaning in sentient agony. Spiraling trails of mold burst forth from the cracks in the rockcrete, and thrashing tendrils and snapping claws erupted from the new quivering flesh of the tower. Putrid blood ran in rivulets from the wounds created by its new abhorrent appendages, and as if trying to escape the horror of its own existence, the tower began to sway back and forth, letting loose a gurgling moan of pain. The floor beneath his feet became flesh-like and spongy, causing Dominic to lose his footing. 
He toppled forward, his hands sinking into the gelatinous matter. As it split apart, bloody yellow pus oozed between his fingers. The tower spasmed and trembled as if struck by a powerful earthquake. The floor heaved upwards, throwing Dominic and Shank backwards as deep, bloody fissures opened across the walls. The entire building seemed as if it was trying to uproot itself, as if it was trying to escape the profane violation that was warping and twisting its form. The upheavals became more violent, and Dominic thought to himself that it wasn't trying to walk away, it was trying to jump. Over the screaming of a thousand mouths that had erupted throughout the tower, for a brief moment, Dominic swore he could hear the heavy roar of a ship's engines. But it was quickly drowned out as the cacophony swelled into its crescendo. The tower twisted and jerked, collapsing and rising at the same time. Large chunks of rockcrete broke free from above and slammed into him, but by the time they made contact had mutated into soft gelatinous chunks of quivering flesh that quickly melted away into slime before evaporating into dust. He screamed and choked on the grotesque effluvium and began frantically trying to swim through the rising tide and waterfall of foulness. But despite his best efforts, the torrent of sickness continued to slam him down, pushing him deeper while the rising tide also violently rose him up. The sensation was beyond disorienting, and he felt himself being crushed by gravity even though every signal in his body told him that some impossible force was dragging him upwards. His own words echoed in his mind. What has fallen from the sky will make us rise again. He could feel his body being crushed from every direction by the liquefying flesh. He tried to scream, he tried to call for help, but all he managed to do was choke down even more of the putrid, liquefied viscera. As he felt the last of his breath leave his body and his bones began to fracture under the pressure, Lord Commissar Dominic Seraf faded into unconsciousness. Dominic came too, hacking and coughing up phlegm. He managed to crack his eyes open, parting a thick layer of dust that had covered his entire body. He was completely disoriented and had no idea where he was, but he could still hear the echo of the city's death scream reverberating in the back of his mind. But mercifully, it was slowly dying away to be replaced with a dull drumming sound that was reminiscent of the wings of a thousand insects. He looked to his left and saw a shank lying beside him, also slowly coming to. He helped her to her feet and they began to take in their new location. They were in an enormous dark room and a faint reverberation could be felt underneath their feet. We we're on a ship. Yes, we are cargo. As the haziness of their eyesight began to fade away and they were able to take in the detail of their surroundings, the true horror of this new locale began to settle in. They were completely surrounded by suffering and disease. The floor was covered in a thick muck of ruined, melting flesh that oozed and suckled at their legs, creating a wet popping sound with every step. In every direction that Dominic looked, he saw hundreds if not thousands of bodies, all in various states of decay. The walls and human remains were covered in thick layers of phosphorescent mold, and the low drumming sound they heard revealed itself to be suffocating clouds of fat-bodied flies that swarmed in their millions high above their heads. The bodies were mostly human, but in the ones that were still mostly intact, Dominic could identify the telltale signs of Eldari, Tau, and other Xeno species as well. To Dominic's horror, despite their terrifying mutilated state, the majority of them were still alive, writhing and groaning with fever. Many were covered in tumors as long as a man's arm that twitched and undulated with grotesque sentience. He witnessed a cascade of maggots bursting forth from the wounds of one man only to burrow inside the wounds of another. The stench of this place was beyond the words of mortal men. It lingered like a thick, pungent miasma that wormed its way through their nostrils and into their very souls, causing the pair to retch and gag with violent spasms. Wiping his mouth clean, Dominic looked out across the veritable sea of decay, and near the center of the room, he witnessed a mound of writhing bodies fused together in sickness into a grotesque mockery of a throne, whereupon he witnessed the master of this realm, the king of pestilence, 
a bloated, armored figure wielding a massive serrated scythe with a single large horn growing from the center of his helm. Even though the pair was at its limit to what the human mind was capable of enduring, when Shank's eyes fell upon the silhouetted figure, Dominic saw a flicker of recognition in her face, her eyes somehow going even wider with fear. D Typhus, Wh where on the terminus est? Dominic had heard that name whispered before. He was a monster of ancient legend, a boogeyman, a dead man's tale that needed to be forgotten, yet clung to existence, refusing to be ignored. He was the plague-induced death of countless worlds, a herald of endless decay. Tears began to stream down Shank's face. <laughs> so you know me. I thought perhaps you didn't. That would have explained your presumption. He rose from his throne of rotting flesh and descended the mound, holding his scythe like a staff of office. His armor was bulged and pockmarked, and Dominic saw insects and other crawling abominations slithering between the cracks. As he approached, Shank took a step back, but there was nowhere to go. Typhus loomed over her, a colossus of plague. Perhaps you thought you'd escaped judgment. <laughs> After the first century had passed, I expect you did. It took me a long time to find you and longer to watch you and tailor your sentence. Judgment, Dominic croaked. Typhus shifted his gaze to the commissar, his eyelids filled with so much contempt and bitter hatred that it caused something vital, something more important and deeper than bone, to fracture inside of his chest. Yes, judgment. She used one of my plagues on Molus, I will not allow such presumption to go unpunished. He turned back to Shank. I've done you the honor of creating a plague specifically for you. I don't understand. I wasn't infected. Typhus was laughing. <laughs> Your ignorance is the point. You seek to understand and control. And you fail. I have killed Aramis with a nightmare. Its transmission from human to human was through fear. Once their terror was great enough, the people were consumed by nightmares and thus became nightmares. And then the dust of horror gave life and death to the inanimate. But you, in your wounded pride, you already believed you were living a nightmare. You, who were strangers to Aramis, who had known heights no native citizen of this dying world ever had. You believed you had fallen so far that only ascension was possible. Your Bitterness was always there, a shield against your fear. Until now. Shank dropped to her knees, the full weight of despair at last bringing her down. That's right. Now you see. Time to end your immunity then. A swarm of insects burst forth from his right pauldron and swarmed over the Inquisitor, relentlessly stinging and biting her. The pain caused her to cry out, and the swarm took the opportunity to rush into her mouth. She fell into the muck, thrashing and spasming in inhuman suffering, her greatcoat splitting apart as putrid fungi began to burst out across her body. Dominic clasped his hand over his mouth and almost stumbled, backing away. You flatter yourself, Lord Commissar. This is her punishment, not yours. Oh, I am immune too, Dominic said, the sting to his pride making him speak in spite of himself. For the same reason, but your pride is misplaced. The fall of Aramis is Ingrid Shank's tragedy, not yours. You do not matter. The thing in Dominic's chest broke. The last blow snapped his pride, and he saw himself for the vain insect that he was. His self-worth fled, and the nightmare came for him. Dominic fell, snakes rising up his throat and coiling in his lungs. His last sight before his eyes turned to dust was the agonized Shank 
being dragged off by Typhus, leaving him alone to be consumed by the nightmare of his unimportance. <laughs> 